Okay, take two. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Gordon McClelland. I'm CEO and founder of Working with Parents in Sport. Um, and I'm delighted to be up here uh, today. Always one of the, the best gigs coming to uh, Edinburgh for the weekend um, to speak. Um, but, uh, but I always say I've probably got one of the best jobs in the world if you love sport like I do, because I get to travel around, I get to talk to thousands of sports parents, I get to talk to thousands of coaches, and I get to visit all kinds of different environments from rugby clubs, football academies, cricket pathways, Olympic gymnastics programs, swimming programs, international hockey programs, schools, clubs, um, across a wide range of sports. And people say, well, what are you actually doing? And I think that fundamentally it's come down to providing some levels of perspective on how we all work together um, so that young people involved in our sport thrive um, both on and off the field, whether we're playing in recreational sport or whether we're playing um, in performance sport. My background is in coaching and education. I coached every age group from under seven all the way through to being paid um, to coach adult sport with some elite under 18s, coached a couple of national title under 13 uh, rugby sevens teams um, during the course of a coaching career that started at 20 when I gave up playing um, through injury. So technically I should be 60 now, but I've still got a bit of energy to do it. So I've part the coaching stuff uh, as it is today. Um, but 10 years ago, uh, my life changed forever when I took my three-year-old son down to the local village hall. He started to kick a football around. I was paying no attention whatsoever, doing all the wrong things and scrolling on my phone because I'd been involved in sport all day and I really wasn't what bothered what he was doing at that stage. And I was approached by a Premier League football scout. Wow, here we go. Hollywood's beckoning. Isn't this the best thing in the world? Somebody's told me that my three-year-old son is good at football. And I probably thought, like most parents, to, oh, I can't wait to get out of here and tell everybody that somebody said, oh, my kid's quite good. And as I was driving back in the car, um, I was thinking, what on earth are you possibly thinking that this is a good thing? Your son's three, you've been in sport and coaching and education. You've seen all these age groups and all these kids. And I got home and I did what most parents do, I think, because nobody tells you how to parent. I typed it into Google. How do you support a five-year-old kid in sport? What do you do when a scout comes knocking at the door? And obviously, you couldn't find a lot. There was lots of information, but it was scattered all over the internet. And it generally portrayed, I guess, parents or human beings as bad, good, helpful, unhelpful. We want it all in one box, but actually human relationships and human nature aren't like that anyway. And quite honestly, with both my children, I'm good, bad, helpful and unhelpful every single week and every single month. And actually making some sense of it, even though I live and breathe this work, is a real challenge. So both my kids have gone on. My son did sign for a Premier League Academy club at the age of nine. So that was very lucky guesswork um, by that scout. Um, but my daughter's better than he is at football. I don't tell him that. And she captains Yorkshire at cricket. So I've got from a parental point of you as well now, the fact that I'm living and breathing this work, and I'm very honest with parents, making a real mess of it on occasions as well. Not the very worst behaviour, I'm not running onto pitches and having goes at referees, none of that stuff, but actually just the general support is a real challenge. And I'm going to try and take you on a whistle-stop tour through what it means to look at it from a organizational perspective in terms of running programs, in terms of running clubs. What does that then mean for our coaches? What support do they need? Because do you know what? In our coaching awards when we did them, nobody ever prepared me for the late night email full of Sauvignon Blanc telling me I'm the worst person ever to be involved in sport because I hadn't selected somebody or all those bits where a parent aren't happy with the decisions I've made or the things that go with it. So the support of our coaches and how we set environments. And then I think we can be quite demanding of parents. The vast majority of parents I've met are actually very very grateful for some support. Now, admittedly, I've got to be very clever because I'm technically telling them how to parent, but it's so well dressed up that they don't realise. But the reality is that actually a lot of them, just like I did, are like, oh, God, I'm glad somebody's tried to make some sense of that uh, for me and look at it from a slightly different um, perspective. 
parental engagement, what does it mean? Didn't exist six years ago. Nobody talks about it. It's become something of quite a cool phrase now. Well, we engage with parents. One thing I would say straight away is a far better phrase than the world of parent education. Some of the places I go, believe you me, if I'd gone in there to educate them, I wouldn't have got out of there. And I think that there's, there's something around our language there. You know, it's, it's about being supportive. It's about being engaging. It's about being encouraging. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to introduce yourself to the person next to you. And if you had to define parental engagement or what would it mean to you, what would be some of the key words that you would be looking to use? 30 seconds. Go. Right, okay, let's get some key words out there. That's why we won't be finished for lunch, because I gave you 30 seconds and that was probably about two minutes. But um, go on then. Uh, any key words? What have we got? Just shout them out. Expectations. Okay. It's amazing, isn't it? Expectations and entitlement, the two biggest words I hear around the world at the moment. <laughs> Try and make some sense of those later. I do talk to parents about both those words, by the way, so you'll be pleased to know that when I speak to them, uh, that certainly comes up in that topic. So I am helping you out without you even realising so far. Um, what else? Okay, the, the, we need them because we're engaged and volunteers, absolutely. Okay, what do, yeah, what is their perspective making sense of that? Yeah. Yeah, buy in. Communication. Communication. Active. active. Active, yeah, actively involved. We discuss knowledge both ways, knowing your parents and then you can get yeah, absolutely. Getting to know your parents. And actually, that's important for us as coaches as well, because it's good if we know our players. And of course, the person who knows the most about their kids is, of course, their parents. So we need those relationships in the first place. It can help us as coaches. It can help us as teachers. Anything else? <laughs> yeah, well, and that, and that, and that's it. Yeah, isn't it? And it. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I think that's critical because what we've got to understand, and we'll see that as we go through, is that how can we have technically what are two of the most important people in a young person's lives pulling in opposite direction? And that, that's really important. And parents can lean on coaches, coaches can lean on parents, but actually coaches get massively frustrated when they do all this amazing work, they're talking to the kids, they've got set off, the parents get into the car, go home and say something completely the opposite. And we're wondering why young people don't know what, what the value or how they're able to make sense of the world. So they're the sort of things that, that we've got to um, sort of work through. But this is our definition as a phrase. It's really hard to try and get it into one sentence. This is about take 195, I think. But this is where we are today, a positive role that a parent can play. You look at most of the parent work that's ever gone on, it's traditionally been very negative. I mean, even the FA campaign around the previous respect one before they went to positive play, 85% of parents didn't even know that there were words coming out of the actual word respect. And you think about how much money's in marketing and how much money something like the Football Association have got. And I think it wasn't the marketing. I think it was just the fact that parents had had enough of being said, you just go and stand over there. You shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be doing that. And actually, what we want to do is we want to inform them. We want them to support them. So actually, they make better choices and the environments we create lend themselves to that. That a parent can play as a partner. So we're recognizing that the part of the process we want them to be involved because obviously working together the kids get a, a, a bigger impact to the organization and coach in the holistic and athletic development of their child now I'm going to assume that I've got the best rugby people in the world in here and the best coaches so I'm not going to talk to you about athletic development I'm going to come back to the, this holistic side so 
this is going to sound really corny and I'm not one of those happy clappy laissez-faire people here because I'm sort of love competition and, and everything that goes with it but when we're working with parents at every level including parents of children who are potentially going to the Olympics or signing million pound football contracts the holistic side becomes really important because if you're a parent and you turn up and you're viewing your child's sport on a regular ba basis, what are you expecting to see and what are you valuing? Because what do you think is the most popular question asked by a parent to their child if they haven't been at a game? What do you think is the first most popular question? Correct, brilliant. Did you win? What do you think is the second most popular question? Did you score? We're good at this, aren't we? We should be on Mastermind this morning. Uh, and then, yeah, yeah, it's all set up, isn't it? And then, uh, and then what do you think is the third most popular question? Because we're getting pretty desperate then, because the kids already said, oh, no, I, I didn't win. No, I didn't score. Uh, well, we might, did you enjoy it if we're lucky? Is generally, oh, well, how did you, were you the best player and how did you compare to everybody else? The kid says, no, oh, well, that's it for another week, you know. And, and off we go. Now, I'm being slightly tongue-in-cheek with that, but that's the reality of it. Now, if that is the only type of dialogue that parents ever, ever have with their kids around sport, the only things young people can value is an outcome. They can't value anything else because we've got to bring it to life. So we're getting parents to look at their kids' sport through the development of life and character skills so that on a given week, they're looking at things like commitment, determination, resilience, creativity, adaptability, self-organized athletes, good decision makers, good communicators, all of these key strands. Because if their children are developing those character traits, if their children are seeing value in those traits, well, actually, all our outcomes will take care of themselves anyway. And it's a lovely way to get parents because if they say they want a professional player or they want a high-performing player, you need those character traits anyway. So whether or not they're in it for that, the reality is we know when everybody at sport gets to a certain level, if you don't have those skills, you're going to fall by the wayside then anyway. So it becomes a really powerful tool for us to get. It gives parents the opportunity to talk to their kids more about their sport. It gives parents the opportunity to value, even on bad weeks, some of the things that their children have done that are positive. But more importantly, when parents say, Gordon, how do I know it's all been worth it? And they've committed time, they've committed money, they've invested in things for their kids' sport. The only thing that I can give them as an answer is that if they view sport, which still remains today one of the safest vehicles to equip their children with a wide range of character and life skills that will allow them to thrive in whatever walk of life they go into, it's absolutely been worth it. Because we can't guarantee professional footballers, we can't guarantee world record holders, we can't guarantee how people are going to end up and go through puberty. And if I could guarantee that, I wouldn't be stood here today. Because I'd be able to put it in a bottle and I'd be in the Bahamas and me and, me and Bill Gates would be good mates. Um, but it's not happened yet. And I don't think anybody is going to be able to, to do that. So back over to you on your tables. You've got one minute. Share some of the best things about sports parents. Go. <laughs> Right, guys, I'm going to let you into a little secret. Um, I said to the first group, I've been in some environments where I've put that up and there's been complete silence for a minute. And it's very entertaining. Coaches looking at each other saying, what, you mean there's a good thing? And you, and you can tell the challenge straight away. They're clearly not having a good time of it because we've all got our relationships with parents. Um, when we start, they're like, oh, they're great, aren't they? Until... The late night text arrives, the late night email, the pushy parent, the challenging parent, the one who winds up everybody else on the side, f spreading false rumours, all those things. And actually, that's what forms our makeup. And so many coaches around the world have said, actually, do you know what? You just stay as far away as possible and we'll get on with it. And you can see how it's happened because of, of the fact that coaches have been stung and that's human nature. So what are some of the best things about parents? A shout out. Support. 
Yeah, so we want positive support or what we deem to be positive, yeah. Willingness. Willingness, yeah. No, no, we certainly don't. Incredible, isn't it? I mean, we even even in a decent level of sport, when I coached, and you know, you had different people who did the forwards and the backs and everything else. It still went through one voice at half time. You know, we just quickly fed in, and one voice did it. I mean, again, you know, players don't need twenty twenty different opinions put onto them in a in a short space of time. Um, it's always nice, I think, when we can link some high-performing stuff back to grassroots as well, because I think parents say, oh, God, is that what they do at a decent level? That means it must be right then, even though it might not be. that They, they, they tend to see it like that. Um, what else? Interest. Yeah. Selfless. Selfless, yeah. Interest. Yeah, yeah, willingness to contribute. I mean, and it's absolutely huge for us. And look, they provide the vast majority of tangible support, don't they? If they don't put petrol in the car, they don't pay the memberships, they don't buy the kit, they don't wash the kit, we've got nobody to coach. So we can at least acknowledge that as a, a really positive starting point. They also know their kids better than anybody else. So going back to that thing, if we're serious about coaching the person in front of us, it's really good if someone can let us know if a kid's been bullied at school, maybe lost confidence, struggling with another aspect of their life. Because I know I changed my practice when I knew inf information about players, whether that meant I spent a bit more time with them beforehand, put an arm around them afterwards, maybe didn't call out them in front of the group and did it all quietly one-to-one. -one. It allows us to make good choices as people either the running clubs um, or as coaches um, they also provide the emotional support and this is the bit we often don't see when their kids are not motivated don't want to go when their children are disappointed with their sport the most popular workshop we get asked to deliver around the world when parents are given a choice how do I what do I do to manage disappointment because it is, it's one of the most difficult things in the world to do as a parent. And I, I will go off on a little tangent, even though I'm on filming, I'm meant to be trying to be professional today, but I'm gonna tell you a little story about disappointment, because this is what plays out all over the world in a lot of cases. When I speak to parents, I ask how many parents want a resilient kid? Every single hand goes up without fail. Well, what, what on earth does that mean? Does that mean we go down to Boots and we get a bottle of pills and then suddenly we become resilient the next day? No, it's far more complicated than that and it doesn't work like that. You know, helping children manage those moments of stress and adversity while still being able to function effectively, physically and mentally. But it's really uncomfortable for us as parents when our children come back, they sit in the car and they're upset and they're disappointed. They may be lost, they haven't been selected. They haven't played well. Things have gone wrong. What do you do? Because it's a pretty uncomfortable spot as a parent. You're thinking, oh God, I really want to make this better and just get on with the rest of my day. So I'm sat, you sit there and I'm thinking, right, I'll try this. Don't worry about it. It's not that important. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I'm telling my child how they should feel. That's not a good thing because it's their feelings. Being upset is all right because that's how you grow from being a child to an adult and that's how you end up emotionally developing well so actually that's okay but i'm also telling them that it's not important and actually it's nothing to do with my journey it's their journey okay gordon good effort there that hasn't worked what else might i do i know i'll blame somebody else I'll blame the referee, the weather, a teammate, the coach, the opposition. I'll find some fault because please stop being upset. I want you to be okay. Now, I'm not sure because at the top end of sport, the very best sports people I know, they don't look to blame. They take responsibility and they seek support and they talk about it and they work through it and they find solutions. So that hasn't worked. Okay, I'm getting desperate now. Oh, I know. I'll make an excuse for you. You had a runny nose on Monday. You didn't train very well on Thursday. You didn't sleep very well on Friday. That's why it's all gone wrong. 
again, not sure anybody wants children who always have an excuse of uh, things not happening or at the top end of sport, we don't want people who always have excuses. Getting really desperate. I know the one that gets me out of trouble every week, I'll take them to McDonald's. <laughs> Because if I take them to McDonald's, it's going to solve a lot of problems, and I played that card the other week. Now, it's slightly tongue-in-cheek, but if that is the only type of dialogue our kids ever have with their parents around sport and disappointment, you can't have resilient children. Because all of those traits go against it, yet this is the difficulty for parents. All of those things are really natural things to do to take the pain away and make the world better. And it's amazing when you tell that story to parents like, oh my God, you're absolutely right. And it's making sense of, of, of these things. So that emotional support, parents do need help with that. Back over to you guys. One minute then, get it off your chest. When are parents most challenging? Off you go. Right, guys, I'm going to uh, stop you there because I've just heard somebody who's going to get us off to a, a good start because I just like what I heard. Can you, can you just share the two, two things that you said challenging about sports parents? I think the uh, challenges of that, it's amazing where parents get some of their expectations from volunteers on. And I think that's because they watch the TV and think that they're just going to be able to copy and paste what they should see in a youth space. And it doesn't look anything like that. And the expertise doesn't look anything like that and nor should it either it's the same with officiating um, good catching up with Hamish Smales who shows I'm getting older I coached him when he was 13 to 18 so it's nice to see him he's now officiating in the premiership but he was talking about he was talking about that and just saying that actually you know you've got volunteer officials and people are expecting them to be operating at the level of the guys on the tv who are still making mistakes every single week as well and we've got to do something to to i guess show parents that no youth sport is not the version of the game you're watching on the tv and the expectations and how we develop young players and all of those things you can't do it the problem we've got is that it's easy for us to talk. If you've been in sport or you're involved in coaching or you're doing it a bit, we've got an understanding of sport. If you're an adult who has just brought your kid into sport and you're not involved, where do you take your information from? Well, you take it off the TV, you take it off the analysis, you take it off social media. You probably go back to what your parents did with you. Well, that could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what they did, and that was quite a while ago. You could also do what your coaches and your teachers did with you but actually coaching and teaching's moved on in the last 25 years as well so actually so without any other support where are they actually getting their information from they're, they're, they're just making up their own thoughts about what sport and what success actually looks like challenging absolutely challenging but i agree i think we've got to help them understand the youth a, a youth environment looks like and it because I, I think they then think that you know, that if they copy and paste what they see up above, that guarantees success, and it absolutely doesn't. It, you know, it really doesn't. That That isn't the environment for young people to get better in. Those days will come if they're good enough, obviously. What else? Challenges? Yeah, I mean, look, most 
again, we talked about entitlement and expectation. The one, the other one that comes up, parents living vicariously through their kids. We wrote an article on the website. I did some research and actually there's very little in it. It's sort of hearsay. And I think what happens is, again, why is it with sport? There's something really powerful about it, isn't there? I've never had stood in a bar here. I've never had an adult come up to me and say, Gordon, do you know what? When I was 11, I was top of my class in maths at algebra. It's, n it's never happened. But I've had an awful lot come up to me and say, Gordon, do you know what? When I was 13, I had a trial with them. No, you didn't. You were rubbish. <laughs> but there, there, there is something about we, us wanting to be linked as a general population to some form of sporting success, badge, talk about it. And I think what happens is we then think, oh yeah, that was the reason I didn't make it was because of this, this and this. No, it wasn't just because of this, this and this. It was because of this, 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 this. And the list keeps going. But what we do is we think, well, if I sort that out for my kids, then that's going to make all the difference. And I think that's exactly what happens. You just try to, I guess, learn from what happened to you and, and give your kids those opportunities. And yeah, again, we can get that very badly wrong if we get the involvement on the wrong side of that. What else? Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, that's the big part of working with the parents, isn't it? You've got to understand your own child, their motivation. Some kids like team sports, some like individual sports. Some p children are better suited to some environments than others. And actually, yeah, it's not about sending them back to everything that we did. It's about them helping them find it by providing those opportunities. And it, you're like, it's great if our kids do do it. But I mean, my, my whole career was coaching rugby and background in rugby. My kids have been nowhere near a rugby field, which, which I'm pleased about. Well, I'm not pleased necessarily, but I've never, it's never bothered me, if you know what I mean, that that, that isn't a route that they've taken. But yeah. That, that <laughs> And a lot of the kids that you know who uh, who uh, children you know you read the, read the Kevin Sinfield book by the way it's just un unbelievably brilliant one of the best books I've read but he talks about his two one one went to Leeds Rhinos followed in Dad's footsteps the other's done something completely the opposite and you know I remember talking to Liam Botham about this who who obviously was a pretty good cricketer and a pretty good rugby player and he ended up canning off cricket because there was no way he wanted to follow what his dad had done or or being anything in that and I think you know we we want to open up those conversations it's just an awareness piece getting people to think what else challenges <laughs> Yeah, and, and look, I think we know even in uh, performance pathways and high-end sport in the teenage years that for all we might want to drive and push it as parents when they're younger, the fact is really, in most cases, it's ultimately got to come from the kids. So parents may be having some quick wins in the early stages where they have more of an input on their kids and what they're doing in a bigger degree of influence, but actually it's ultimately got to come from them. Now, not in every case. I've got a lot of families in football academies who kids are doing it to 
make enough money to get the families out of a, a lesser standard of living. I've seen that in some other sports, in, in cricket in particular, in some of the Asian communities, I've seen elements of that where it's, it's about changing everybody's family. It's a different type of pressure. And I had a young 17 year old boy in an Olympic program who I think will end up at the Olympics. And I said, why are you here? What's motivating you? And his answer was, I don't want to let down mum and dad. Oh no, what an answer. I don't need to hear that. And, and knowing his parents as well, they would have been mortified I didn't tell them because I didn't need to it was I didn't need to get involved at that stage but it wasn't a great quality of motivation that that was what was what was motivating him but shows what can happen if we're not talking to our children as parents when we're going when we're going through all of the sport yeah Yeah, I mean, we've got to try and somehow facilitate a conversation that puts the kid at the centre of it, haven't we? Like everything where the kid's been asked some of the questions about, you know, how they how they feel and how they're viewing it and and give the parents the opportunities to <coughs> see that. And look, we, we try and drop things like that into parents' workshops. We should know why our kids are playing. The answers will change as they go through because obviously a seven-year-old is going to have a different response to a 13-year-old or a 13-year-old to a 17-year-old, but it is important. And, and the other one, we're not going to get through this workshop this morning. We're just having a good chat, aren't we? Um, the other one that you see... Um, a lot of is I always say to parents their kids have to know that they can come and say I don't want to do this anymore now if my kids did that to me this morning I'd feel like a massive punch in the stomach and I'd be thinking God, all that time all that money all that investment everything and everything that I've done but then I've got to remember kids aren't commodities. I'm not playing the stock market here. They're, they're, they're human beings. Um, now, obviously, what you don't want them parents to do is say, oh, yes, of course, little Johnny, you can give that up tonight. It's not a case of doing that. It's investigating why they don't want to play. Make sure they see out a commitment, that block out of time, and then review the situation um, with them. But I do think that dialogue has to be on the table for young people like that because there is a fear for them. You know, including that kid going to the Olympics. He obviously didn't want to say that that, that was why he didn't want to do it because he didn't want to let down mum and dad. You know, tough. I think you've got to get the kid in there. I think you've got to get the kid at the centre speaking. Child's voice can be really powerful. What else? Can I just <coughs> yeah. regards to ignorance and the ignorance in the sense of not knowing what laws of the game I and mean, when a game starts the touchline behaviour I, I, I know, I know football is a different sport from rugby but the only description I can get is it's football rest where they're getting that more and more yep. and yeah. then what happens for me if that isn't addressed at a point then it ripples out the way and if somebody says it the person looks and says oh nothing happened so it must be right or if the coach doesn't say anything, it's on the touchline. And that, that's, that creates a negative pitch environment because yep. you're not. I, I've heard under 11 football and they're getting criticised and getting dropped and getting put off the team because they're not good enough. We don't have that in the game, and yet I think touchline behaviour is a thing. I know it's been batted about year and year, but I think it's very important. Yeah, and I think you've got to, I think you look again, you look at campaigns that have gone on about the side and understanding the environment, coaches setting the tone as well about how they work with officials, how they're behaving, because parents, if we get that wrong, parents will just copy us. You know, if we're stood shouting at officials, we're just giving carte blanche for everybody behind us to, to do it as well. What's interesting in the world of football, they take football in football academies, my son would think, we're, we're, we're not allowed to shout anything. We're allowed to clap, and we get we get pulled we get pulled in. If anybody overdoes it at any point, they're pulled in and they're told. So. Yeah, yeah.
We've played ga we've we've got a game that we're not playing today that we play in our parents' workshops where they have to come up and do an activity in front of the whole group of parents and they do it for twenty seconds in silence and it's normally really intricate so they get a bit nervous because there's lots of people watching them just like they do with the kids do it in silence and you see the nerves you have 20 minutes as though it's Rangers v tw sorry 20 minutes 20 seconds of Rangers v Celtic where everybody's allowed to yell everything well this domino rally game there's parents knocking dominoes over as parents are shouting and screaming and all of this and then you get 20 seconds of applause and encouragement and suddenly adults start smiling and like oh hang on I can do this and it's a really good reflective piece to say, hang on a minute, we're expecting young people to operate in the environments you've just shown that we can't create and actually look at the difference on how you felt and we're putting that onto them. And I do think there's a wider piece because obviously you can't just do that in isolation. That that then will we'll come onto the environment. We've got an American football le video later. You'll feel better about your touchlines, by the way. But but it is a it, it, it is a challenge though. <laughs> No, and I think we've got. Yeah, I think we've got it, and, and I think we've. That's everybody, isn't it? Around around that, we've got to enhance the the understanding, and and I'm going to whiz through these next few because we've already touched on loads of them. But the reality is that parent influence is huge. Till the kids get to the middle of the teenage years, parents and carers have the biggest influence. Um, child should always be at the centre of the experience. We've got to acknowledge the parents are key, but actually, we've still got all of these things that are going to happen because look sport is a huge escape for parents compared to their day-to-day -day life it's still an absolute joy at the weekend when you get to watch your kids play sport you know it's far better than paying the bills and going shopping with your missus for example you know it, it is what it is that that's what happens um it's a passion it draws opinion um and that hasn't helped by sky tv and look everybody's going to be proud of the kids people are allowed to dream that that's going to be part of what we've got but you've just talked about this here because parents find competition really stressful even at the very top end of sport it is difficult watching your kid compete particularly if they're having a nightmare and it's going wrong and there's nothing that you can do about it because all your emotions say that I need to step in, I need to try and solve this, I need to try and make this better. And that's where we get the worst, I guess, side of this. But if actually around competition, parents struggle with the fact that they may have to interact with other parents, there may be another coach who causes a problem for them, there may be the official who is doing things that they don't like to see. Obviously, their, their children being disappointed, worrying about how they're going to pick up the pieces from that can be really emotive again bringing back top end of sport to help you we've done work with parents and children together and they've both acknowledged this really sensitive period after competition where actually a parent needs half an hour well away from the kids and the, the athletes need time well away from the parents as well chance for parents to gain perspective uh, gain back some control think about how they're going to talk to the kids and actually the kids don't need the parents in the rear straight after a game telling them what what they did wrong you know everybody's emotionally physically mentally tired uh, um, so, you know, we're trying to support those things. They struggle with organisation in terms of time from cl in terms of time it takes up, lack of information from clubs, maybe if it comes late, comes late from coaches. They struggle with perceptions of favouritism. Parents struggle with selections. Although I do say to parents, I'm yet to meet a parent who's got an issue with selection until their kid's on the wrong side of it. I've never had anybody come into an environment and say, God, I hate selection. The moment the kid's on the wrong side of it, it's the worst thing we've ever, we've ever invented. And I think we've got to be very clear, and certainly when we do coach workshops, very clear about our 
selection and how we select really explicit whichever route we want to take that needs to be out there and everybody needs to know no wriggle room that's what we do um, before they make any choices about whether they want to be part of it or whether they're they're doing that's what we do in this environment and then from a development piece just later on if the kids do end up you know leaving your clubs becoming good players uh, balancing education with their training can become a challenge where they go to university um, parents trying to make sure that their kids have other interests or the hobbies worried about if it goes wrong because it's been the only things in their lives there's there's lots of things that are going on there and again we touched on this that children aren't commodities parents can't expect to come to our programs commit time and money and then expect a professional rugby player that's that's not what it can be about it just can't be so we have got to sell the wider ranging benefits of our program through our sport what else does our sport give us we all know about the values of rugby we all know about it but what we've maybe lost sight of is we don't talk about it enough for children to value those things we have to be celebrating it in our environment you know if we're running awards or where we've got coaches running weekly awards and it's only ever for the try score for the player of the week again the environment suggests that you know i could do player of the season for my son's football team next year and he hasn't even started can probably do the top score for you now while i'm at it as well i'll hazard a good guess but that's not valuing what's important because everybody should be able to celebrate and win but we've got to help bring those to life in our environments i'm not saying you can't have those by the way because as i said i'm not one of those happy clappy people either I, I'm, I'm saying that there has to be a balance between everything and all the time you know that link back to those character skills um can be really powerful and, and you know when kids are doing a lot of sport in particular we're trying to promote the multifaceted child so so we've got to do an amazing job as clubs, as coaches, in what, how we paint the picture. We've been talking about it this morning, trying to make sense of what our programmes do, what do we offer, what should you expect to see from our coaches, what is everybody's expectations, and we've got to make a big thing of it, and we've got to talk about it, and we've got to get it out there right from the very start. And I'm not here to tell you which of these um you should be running that that isn't my role but what i do know is that we can run all of these in one environment uh, perfectly possible to run all three it's difficult but we may have people playing for different reasons people playing um, they all present different challenges in themselves but I think we've got to be proactive transparent communicate well about our environment our club what we're trying to do and remain really true to what we think is right and all the time if we can make sure that yes of course we are trying to win everybody's trying to win we all want to win. Don't let anybody tell you that it, you know, and I'm not saying that, you know, everybody says, oh, it, it's not about the win. No, it isn't. But everybody's still trying to win, whether, whether we like it or not. And everybody likes winning. But actually, can we be better that? Can we have more going on? Can we be celebrating more things um, on a regular basis? And through our, our uh, clubs and programs, we're trying to align these. We've got to make sure that the culture and the values set by the club, the coaches are then merely gatekeepers of that wider culture because what we can't have is we're saying actually do you know what guys we're all about development in this club we're going to give people equal opportunities this is what we believe is right and we've got the under nines doing it brilliantly there and then over on the under 11 pitches we've got somebody being Gregor Townsend and everybody's getting pulled off when they're getting beat and everybody's making changes we've got to make sure that we're seeing common themes across any given environment and it's not about about coaching robots I'm asking you to coach in the same way I'm talking about the values and the messaging coaches are the gatekeepers of that wider culture and then and then we can start supporting parents we can start being more demanding of parents because everything they see aligns with what we've said we're going to do now look the year before my son signed his um, 
academy contract. They had a very good group of under eight footballers, played obviously in the league system in England. There was a cup competition. They had 10 very good players and we were told, seven aside, beginning of the season, that everybody would rotate complete equal game time. And that's what they did. So every third game you'd start on the bench, you'd come off in your third sections, everybody did it. And then of course, you get your first V second in the league. And you get to the last 20 minutes and you're thinking, God, this is tight, this is a nightmare. And they kept doing what they said they were gonna do. The best team weren't on the field in the last 20 minutes and they come second in the league. Happened in a cup semi-final. Probably the best seven on the pitch, they probably win. That didn't happen, they lost again. I go back to the car, chuntering away to myself, moaning about the world. And my wife said, but she said, do you know what? They told you that's how they were gonna do it. They've been consistent, they've stuck to what they said, and I got over it very, very quickly. I hadn't said it to anybody else, but the reality is she was right, because we, th that was the approach they'd said they were gonna do, and fair play to them, they stuck by it. They didn't have people jumping and changing the rules, that, that's what they'd said, and I think that becomes really, really important. And in terms of creating positive parent cultures, we know with the way sport's gone, safeguarding society, everything, we can't have this idea of parents staying way over there, walls of concrete, no communication, coaches and athletes going the other way. We've got to try and open the doors. But then we've also then got to provide support for the volunteer coach, for coaches, you know, doing all their rewards. Because what we don't want then is, and I think there's a fear from coaches that if we involve the parents too much they're going to take a mile and they're going to become even more overly involved in the ways that we don't want to see but again that's where the support comes to the parents because it's not good to micromanage your kid if you micromanage your kid, you expect perfection, and perfection doesn't exist. And what we need to get to is this stage where parents and coaches are understanding that that's the parent role, this is the coach role, we're all working together, the messaging, the value is all underpinned by the same things, and we're working together in the best interests of the kid. Those of you, um, just going back to the sideline support and how parents perceive competition. Look, the reality is, again, and this sounds funny, they're only copying what they see on the TV, a lot of them. That's all that happens in football. I ran sport in an independent school for 15 years, and I'd have the most, the rugby guys would come out from September to December, they'd warm themselves up, there'd be self-organization, the kit would be put up away, the discipline was absolutely brilliant, we had the program, absolutely brilliant. We'd have a four week Christmas holiday. And the world changed because out came the bag of footballs. And I'd walk out to the pitch, there'd be balls flying everywhere, there'd be kids behaving like absolute clowns and idiots and whatever. And I said, what, what, what's happened in four weeks? And they would say, oh, well, it's football. And we've said that in some football clubs at the moment. It's no good us now just saying, oh, well, this is what we do in football. What, what the hell does that mean? Does that mean we're just going to condone any form of, of bad practice and, and accept it? You know, and, and, and this is where the whole environment and people's understanding of, of what it is that's going on, we've got to set it in those specific environments. Um, and I got caught out on this um, when you talk about watching your kid and what parents are watching. Very good friend of mine, Sarah Murray, we, we wrote a book together on performance parenting. And she said, Gordon, how often do you watch your child's game? Thinking, what a strange question that is. We've just written a book. You know me pretty well. I go most weekends if I'm not working. I love watching my kids play. And she said, no, Gordon, how often do you watch the game? And I'm like, you know, you've asked me that. So what, what are you talking about now? And then I'm thinking, oh no, no, I'm walking into something here. She's far brighter than me, far, far better looking than me. I'm thinking I'm in trouble here. So she said, what do you do when you go and watch Liverpool play football? And I was then deliberately being awkward. I said, well, I have a few drinks and you'll never walk alone, have a good day out, you know? And she said, yeah, she said, tell me this. She said, when you're watching the game, she said, are you watching the ball? Or are you watching Virgil van Dijk for 90 minutes? And I said, well, 
I'm watching the ball. She said, yeah. She said, and do you do that when you're watching your son play? She said, I bet you stood there. You'll be watching all his mannerisms, all his behaviours, picking out on every little mistake, ready for the chat afterwards. And it was like, yeah, okay, fair enough. I acknowledge that I probably do a, a fair amount of that as well. And we thought, well, this is really interesting. So you're watching your kid and you're thinking, God, I made a load of mistakes there. We thought we'd go to the Premier League for some stats. Mo Salah dribbles the ball eight times and gives it away four. Harry Kane scores one in five shots. Could you imagine our parents on those success rates on the sideline? They'd be having absolute kittens. Could you imagine ten passes in a game and you've dropped five of them? They'd be having a heart attack and wanting to know what, what's going on. And yet at the very top end of sport, and we pulled it out with the cricket stats this week, working with Cricket Scotland, you know, Jasper Bumrah, the great Indian bowlers, paid 52 one-day internationals. He's only ever took five wickets twice. You know, the Yorkshire opener last year, I think scored 50s and 100s in 17% of his innings. One in six. Now, could you imagine some of our youth parents watching sport on those percentage success rates? They'd be really, really struggling. It's a really eye-opening thing. And just again, ho hopefully a little couple of stories there to, to, to help you on your way. But I think that all of this stuff that we're talking about and, and trying to do it does come down to how well are we communicating? What does it actually look like? And you know, what is the type of information that's going out to parents? Is it consistent? You know, are we doing it regularly? Are things reinforced about the values, what we value here, why? that we do the things that we do. But more importantly, what I said earlier, and this was from uh, something in the independent school sector, they said we're all about developing young people, we're all about developing um, sport, giving everybody opportunities. And you went onto their social media feed and all they ever talked about was the A-team and the elite. So they've said that they're doing one thing and actually that isn't what's been presented to the rest of the world. So our ability to, to bring those into line become important. Methods is an interesting one for me because emails, texts are all right for information. Who has the nightmare of the WhatsApp group? <laughs> I've removed it. I, do you know what? I've removed it from here. And I'll tell you why. The nightmare of the WhatsApp group for coaches. Sets out with great intentions. We get information. And then it becomes everybody's social diary. Who's winning Strictly this week? What am I having on my pizza? I'm doing And actually, all we want as coaches is the bit of information that we actually require. What's coming out of the GAA in Ireland, and this is an interesting one, is if you use WhatsApp groups, people can leave messages on there, leave the group, and the messages can't be deleted. Now, technically, if we're looking in education, we've got a data protection issue there, and, that, and that's probably why they don't use them. And I'm not saying it is a major thing. This might be something that will come five years from now. But it is interesting. That's why I've highlighted Spond at the bottom. I think these apps that are GDPR compliant, that allow coaches to save time, where you put in a fixture, you put in the map, it's one post for you, and every parent just clicks a button, because parents can be lazy as well reading stuff. You just get your list it takes out all of the messaging bits different people ways of replying icons things that you can miss and I'm obviously about trying to make your lives easier on the ground and and more efficient so I think there's something around those we've got to consider Twitter and Facebook are brilliant for sharing things that back up your philosophies things that you believe are important because sometimes and this is the really sad thing Sometimes, and I found this with my business. Look, working with parents in sport six years ago is Gordon McClellan sat on a hill in North Yorkshire. Nobody knows that. Did I have lots of work to start with? No. But the moment you can say you're working with Man United girls or British gymnastics, suddenly everybody's knocking at the door. Well, he must know what he's doing. And actually, it was no different. 
who was, st who was still the same, but parents like that idea. They're not very good sometimes at listening to it. You know, when we promote stuff in schools to say, yeah, well, you're working with British Gymnastics and uh, Newcastle football and Wolves and everything, and it's like, oh, oh, we'll all come. If it's just Gordon McClellan from around the corner in North Yorkshire, there'd be 10% of the people there. And there's something about the power of, of that higher level of sport. So getting the other people that are writing the content, nick them, put posts out there so it doesn't feel that it's coming from you all the time, but you are enhancing your levels of support for them. And it is backing up some of the amazing work that you guys are doing. And I always think with parents that if we ever have to have a difficult conversation or something that is crucial to their kid, we should be trying to do it face to face. It's massively difficult because, and I've spoken to lots of coaches who just dread it because you don't sleep. And I think about, and I know Duncan at the back there who runs a sports program in the school, you'd receive late night emails and you'd be like, you just wouldn't sleep for days. You'd be terrified about the chat. You'd be thinking, oh my God, I know exactly what I'm gonna get here. But ultimately, I do think the better dialogue happens face to face because you can at least convey some human emotion, some empathy, arrange a time that isn't in front of other people and have that dialogue. How many times do we receive information via words, either from text or email? I mean, even from our partners, can you just do this? No, I bloody can't. You know, and, and, and actually it wasn't intended like that at all. I mean, it might have been, but it, but. Yeah, that's, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, and we can react to that, can't we, and it is, and I, I think that's, uh, a, a, again, it's, it becomes a real skill. Now, I'm doing well, I'm catching up my time, one fire after our slow start, we might get to the end. Well, I've got eight questions here. Um, just to give you a chance, um, just to consider um, what you think, and I've got, I've got four, I've got three, to we'll use three groups. I'm going to give you a few minutes now. Table one, do we provide clear communication and support? I want you to have a chat about that in your environment. If you think you do, yes, brilliant, say what you think you do well. If there's some stuff, having listened, you're thinking, uh, we do some of it quite well, not others, great. And if you sit there and think, actually, do you know what? I'm not sure how well we do this at all. Fine, just say it, it doesn't matter because everybody is gonna be at different stages. You guys can do a parent's respected for their contribution by, by the club. Think about how we value volunteers. Think about the roles we give them, what's in it for them, what they're doing. Um, group over there. And actually, you've got the toughest task here. So group over there. Do your coaches across the whole of your environment have a positive attitude towards parents? Is it a mixture? What does it look like and why? Why do you think that may be? And then you guys, because that question isn't quite as long, you can maybe jump over to question one as well. I'm going to give you five minutes. Go. round this up good to see some of you taking photos of that you can obviously carry it on in your own clubs it's quite a nice task to do some of these questions I've narrowed it down a little bit for you today um, if you do want the full list of questions that we normally ask across environments I'll um, please email me on the website I'll, I'll send them to you very happily but what do we think then clear communication and support what are we thinking 30 give me a one minute synopsis of all your talks about I was going to, I was just about to say that to you, I, and, and this isn't, this, don't tell you this wrong, I'm not a big fan of codes of conduct, but not because we don't have to do them. Somebody pulled me up on this the other week. We obviously have to have things in place that we need. 
problem is in so many environments we create the code of conduct which goes back to the things that we said haven't worked with parents because it's a list of things you do and you don't to start with and we know that hasn't really landed but what happens is they come out at the same time every year they get signed everybody says they're going to do it and then they disappear into the glove box till the same time the following year and three weeks later somebody's doing something that they said they weren't going to do and nobody's pleased it so the challenge for us is how we keep bringing that to life can we make it more values based cultures based obviously the code of conduct's got to be there but what can we do to make those environments even better and that's that that is the the challenge to all behaviour and we're going to come on to that we're going to come on to what a uh, quick bit on the coaches bit now thank you parents respected Brilliant. Thank you. And I, I think we'll have that. But I, I hear things like, you know, can we give them a bit of kit? Can we make them feel valued? And, you know, a story from performance sport is amazing. The, I'll never forget this. Georgia May Fenton, the, the Great Britain gymnast, her mum came to one of my sessions and we were chatting away afterwards. And she said, Gordon, you know, I really enjoyed some of that. I could have done with it five years ago. But she said, here's the thing. She said, you've told me a lot of the stuff that was really helpful. He said, I, she said, I would have just bloody loved it once if a coach had acknowledged me as a human being and she said and just said hello good afternoon thanks for bringing her and she'd been through a whole system and actually it hadn't anything to do with the information and support it was just that basic acknowledgement and I say to coaches now just you can quickly say good morning good afternoon thanks for bringing them good evening one one quick 10 second statement this isn't about sitting down and having an hour giving feedback to every kid because we haven't got the time to do that but the ability just to put a name to a face and acknowledgement and do it stands us in such good stead for later on and yeah actually most of us would sit there and say well yeah but it doesn't always it doesn't always materialise. Doesn't happen. Can we give them bits of kit? Everybody loves a badge. Everybody loves the power of the badge and a bit of value. It makes us feel good. It makes us look important. You know, it, it is good. So you know, can we incorporate that? But obviously, there's funding issues. Um, far table. Do the coaches have a positive attitude towards parents? No. And that's what we would and that's what we would expect to see in every sport, every environment, academies, the lot, whatever systems, because the people, as I say, who have been through it, maybe slightly more old school, don't want anything to do with them. There's people who've been stung really badly by groups of parents, there's people who've had major conflict. They then don't really want anything to do with them. They want other people to do it, they want to keep them aside. You get some fresher coaches who are all right with it because that's where they've grown up until it goes wrong and need support. So actually that's what we do get and actually that's when I sort of get passionate about the coach education thing because we want to help support coaches in some of these things now these are just the, again just take a picture of these so we can move it on do we give parents a voice in the process now that isn't about opening up the doors where the parents suddenly tell you everything you're meant to be doing. Likewise, the child's voice isn't about children turning up and saying, no, I don't fancy doing that today. This is what I'm going to do. That isn't what it's about. But can we send out feedback form to our parents do our parents feel safe to contact us to have a chat do we run parents meetings in our clubs to get them in have a drink introduce ourselves what we're going to do do they get a chance to talk about their kids and tell us about them so f f a parent voice can be can be done in many different ways the worst case scenario 
and I am and I'm pulling stuff from all over the world as I said I would just to give you an insight the worst case scenario I've heard of this and I'm, and I'm sure it w and I'm, well it won't be happening because it's different level but a mum rang me spoke to me for two hours had never met me before to tell me how her daughter was abused in gymnastics and an hour into that conversation she said Gordon I knew something was wrong but didn't feel like I could do anything about it and I didn't know whether to shout at her for her parenting, to shout at the system, to shout at the coach, or whatever. It was, it, was, it was a bizarre couple of hours. And it was purely because she did not feel safe to raise with an organisation or a particular coach because she was worried about the negative ramifications for her and her child. And had got to the stage where she clearly put a child's safety below anything that was important. And I think I tell that story just because... I think it just makes us, I mean, you can't believe it when you hear this. It's just absolutely outrageous, but it shows the power that we hold, the things that we have, and what we've got to value and make sure that we've got right. Number five, do we use language that people can connect with? We need to get people on side. We need people to follow. And one of the massive successes of working with parents in sport is in any of our parents' talks, any of our content, anything on our website, the person in the middle of Merseyside must be able to work with it and that isn't a slant against the people of Merseyside that's because I make sure that when I'm there watching the football that if someone stood talking to me they don't have to agree with everything I say but they can at least relate to it and apply it in their everyday lives so it's no good boring them with you know nutrition and glycemic index and everything else no what food do they need to give the kid can we help them cook it it's, it's all those bits so we've got to be using language that people can relate to and number six when people come into our environments at the beginning they haven't got a preformed idea of what they're finding and you'll see in the final video later on about social conformity most people go into an environment and behave on what is happening there we won't be seeing people singing you'll never walk alone on match point at Wimbledon next month it won't be happening because you'd look odd because that's not what everybody else is doing. Likewise, at the British Open Golf, there aren't people screaming out on the 18th hole over the four foot putt. It's deadly silent because everybody else next to them, because naturally as human beings, we fit to what we find and what we see, which goes back to the bit you said about we need more and more good people calling out the bad stuff. So the people who are then there are really isolated. It looks wrong and it looks badly wrong as opposed to just hiding in amongst everything else. Number seven, obviously, again, just, you know, if we provide good space, facilities, social functions, drinks, obviously it just makes parents feel slightly better about the world. Um, these are a few ideas. What are they watching in training and competition? Parents supported to concentrate on the individual journey of their own child. We've got to know our parents. We've got to know where these kids are coming from. Some parents don't even engage. So do we as clubs and coaches need to support those individuals a little bit more? Information needs to be easy to find. Use your social media. Everybody's on it. Everybody's using it. Make sure information's on your website. You only have to do it once and update it to make sure that you've got things in place. Really clear information targeted and given to parents so it's really parent facing. Could run parent sessions in your clubs get every parent in your club into a parent session supporting your kids how's the best way to do it make it fun if you need some help with that i'm happy to support that parents need to understand that as we said earlier the adult space is not the youth space and we've got to embrace technology uh, to communicate with parents my final bit of the session is this so what is the role of the coaches well they're following the wider organizational culture they are the gatekeepers if we've got coaches struggling with parental engagement then they need support from more experienced people. I mean, the Gordon in his 20s, he didn't talk to parents. I knew everything when I was coaching. I didn't want them anywhere near 
was it a good approach now as I got a bit older I got a little bit wiser and got better when I became a parent myself I realised actually you know it wasn't necessarily the best way of going about it but what I do recognise is it also gets easier to have difficult conversations with experience because you're more self aware you've got an understanding from the other side so younger coaches when I go into universities obviously oblivious to this they're 19 and they've got a few sort of older grizzly warriors on the side of their first coaching team and it can be quite intimidating so we've got to help support them but we've got to be consistent and possible when delivering uh, you know messaging and, and values final slide of the day because I think this is quite impactful I'm going to show you two very different videos here about environments and coaching I'm not going to lie I have picked the most extreme examples you can possibly find to make a point <laughs> you might feel better about your own environments in a minute but what I want you to think about when you're watching this is if you were a parent and you just arrived into this environment, I want you to think about what would parental support look like in this environment, but I want you to think about the relationship piece. What would the relationship look like between coach and child, coach and parent, parent and child. Now I admit we're doing a lot of Sherlock Holmes guesswork here because we've got no context but the video will give us a lot of indicators or both videos will give us a lot of indicators about the importance of the environment. See what you think. Esquire Network presents a sneak peek of Friday Night Tykes. You have the opportunity today to rip their freaking head off and let them bleed. If I cut them with a knife they're going to bleed red just like you you go out there like Junior Broncos, you play Junior Bronco football, and you can do it. If you believe in yourself, you can do whatever it is you want to do in life. Do it now, though. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Do it now. One, two, three. This is the Texas Youth Football Association, one of the elite football leagues for kids in America. And the eight and nine year old rookie division in San Antonio features the best of the best. Hey, you give me that soft crap. There should be no reason why y'all don't make other teams cry. I could care less if they cry. The teams are ultra competitive, demanding commitment. This is where you earn your playtime. Sacrifice <laughs> and intensity. You can do this. You are stronger than this. I'm sorry. Five teams. We come out screaming and yelling. Yeah. Five heated runs. Oh, we gotta fight! We gotta fight! Only one can win. You're so worried about winning that you're not playing. I don't care how much pain you're in, you don't quit! People, you guys forget that they are babies. Okay, if that kid comes across, I want you to put it in his helmet. Do you understand? Yes, sir. I don't care if you don't get up. Let's go. Friday Night Tykes premieres January 14th at 9 on the new Esquire Network. Told you might feel better about the world there. Huh? The sh shot for me, the eight and nine year olds, that was when it really hit home. Um, quite incredible. Good to see the dad rolling back stuff from the 80s there when he was at school. If we can't do 500 bear crawls, then clearly we're not going to make it. But you know, you see elements of lots that we've talked about. But how about this then? So, just your feelings on these. Okay, so very coach dominant, very dictatorial. Parents will be watching. What do you think? What do you think they'll be valuing? Yeah. You would think. You would think, but actually, that a bit like the gymnastics store has just become normalised. So actually, the coming into it, that's what you do. That's what you do in the youth football. <laughs> yep. Yep. There, that would, that's normal. Yeah, yeah. Hang on. Go on. Go on. Yeah, yeah. So we've got stuff around language, haven't we, again? I'm trying to link to stuff we've talked about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very outcome-driven, elite. This is what it is. This is how you get to the top. No one challenging what development looks like. Dictatorial. Yeah. 
Yeah, oh, your course is. Yeah, I'm sure they're making a lot of money out of it as well. So lucky them. No, nope, there you go then. So when we talk about children have a voice, us working with young people, us coaching well, would a child go and speak to that coach? Very much doubt it. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. I'm gonna. I'll maybe chat with you and Duncan at lunchtime. I've got. I've got some interesting views on. I've got some interesting views on that because it goes back to that commodity piece. Uh, I think it drives parents and independent sectors absolutely mad that they can't buy success in sport and I think it drives them absolutely up the wall because in a lot of other aspects of their life they're able to to buy it and smooth the path and they find it very very difficult um, and they are expecting re return on their investment and we've got to be very brave haven't we in saying that Yeah, absolutely. They want a piece of it, and I think same same in the US. I think if you're paying large amounts of money, you expect to see progress and results, don't you? The trouble in sport is, yes, we're going to see progress, but we can't guarantee who's going to be the best. So I think that does alter behaviour because I think if you're committing a lot of money and a lot of time, you become far more um, stressed by the by the whole experience. I mean, loads to think about. Right, last video because I'm running out of time. Last video. This is totally the opposite. Right. Well, quiet. parents, thank you for coming to the game today. Today we're playing a match and we are very grateful that you've taken us here, taken the time out of your days to come and support us and watch us. We are very thankful for that. Today we're playing a tough game, we're playing under 17 squad. It will be tough for us, but we can prevail if we work together as a team. So I appreciate all your support for coming to watch us and on the field, the support you give us is very great. We're trying words of encouragement and saying hot luck and stuff. It's very great for us. When we're on the field, we would prefer if we don't get instructions from the parents a lot of times because sometimes we do get shots and instructions. And we prefer not because sometimes it disrupts what we were thinking because we know, because we have our view of what, what, what's happening. And sometimes the parents view might be different to what we can see in our own time. So we would prefer sometimes if we don't get instructions and, and we can play how we want to play without having any pressure. Uh, today our success criteria is going to be working on the rule of three, which for those who don't know, the rule of one is my, myself, so it's addressing myself. Rule of two would be is the team, so if a player messes up and he doesn't address himself, a teammate must do it for him. And if the teammate doesn't do it for him, then the coach must step in as the rule of three. So today our work on, our success criteria will be getting that down, so Coach Darren doesn't have to speak a lot today, he doesn't want to, he wants to just scan us to do it today. And our second rule, our second success criteria would be to working on passing on releasing, moving the ball, not dribbling when we don't have to, or if we have to take on a player then release it or do one twos. So those are two main success criteria today. So if you see that we are, for example, in a position where we could maybe have a long shot, but we decide to rather work around the team and try and play through the ball, it's not because we don't want to shoot, it's because we're trying to address our success criteria and break down the team. Okay. Right, very interesting, totally the opposite. What do we think? 17 year old boy, impressive. How would I feel as a parent? I'm not so sure I want my 17 year old telling me what's going to happen, but that's a, a different thing. But I would have bought into it, however, based on the fact it had been well thought out. General feelings on that one then. What are we thinking? Very clear, success criteria addressed. What are we trying to do today? Was it about the outcome? No, we were working on specific things. That's what we want you to highlight. The bit that makes me laugh in that video is the bit about Coach Jonas. He even sticks up for Coach Jonas. Because the rule of three was, if there's a mistake, it's up to me to try and self-solve it myself on the field of play without support. If I can't do it, the rule of two was one of my teammates will help me do it. And only then rule three was Coach Jonas was going to speak. Well, Coach Jonas in the UK on a Sunday morning in football would be accused of lacking passion and not being very good at coaching because where's Coach Jonas yelling five million instructions in the next 20 minutes? And actually, poor, well done Coach Jonas because his kid's done a, a a good job there. Child's voice is powerful. It's coming from the kids. You 
could see that and you would hope to see in amongst all of it hopefully very good relationships between all of the different people. I hope you've enjoyed this morning. Um, please check out the Working With Parents In Sport website. There's a huge amount of information on there um, for parents, for coaches, the stuff from grassroots and recreation all the way through to high performance. There's videos and podcasts. We're very lucky uh, that we get sports stars from all around the world who come and join the podcast. Uh, particularly topical today there that Liz McColgan somehow got on that screenshot. That wasn't deliberate, but uh, her talking about her time with Ailish, that's fitted in pretty well. We've got a number of books that we support organisations with that can be customised, books for parents. These can be customised by clubs, by national governing bodies, which they are. There's books for coaches, there's books for the parent coach, the parent who volunteers and the dynamic of not only having to look after your own kid at home, but everybody else's and the fact that nobody tells you that it's not just about turning up and putting the cones out that you've got a whole heap of admin to do and logistical stuff so there's some in there and then our, our latest book is the sports performance parenting one we've got a range of rugby books that try to bring uh, sport to life for parents and kids giving children a voice in the process getting children off devices getting parents to communicate effectively with the children around some of these life and character to skills children talking about it. You can see what Leinster Rugby have done with the end one. They've branded it across the province. They're available in all of their clubs. And that, this goes through from under five to under seven to under nine. It covers two sporting years and, and just trying to help clubs and coaches get those messaging across to parents and the children valuing what they are going through. And then if you're really interested in the topic or you've got children who you know may be interested this is our latest book. Judy Murray wrote the foreword. It's had huge acclaim from the sporting world. We take parents on the journey from the start all the way through to the end, whether that may be the Olympics, professional sport, the teenage years. We talk about managing disappointment, sports parenting, the teenage brain, all the things that go along the journey that nobody ever helps us out with um, as parents. And that's available exclusively on the Parents in Sport website. There's all the details. There's all the social media. I'm around for the rest of the day. If people want to grab me at lunchtime or grab me this afternoon, very happy to talk about the, the world of sport with you. So thank you so much for your time and enthusiasm this morning.